Greetings. This is the first uh, full week of Lent, <clears throat> and uh, Sunday will be the first Sunday in Lent, and so I have decided to do a series on uh, the meaning and message of the cross. So <clears throat> the title today is A Revelation of God's Love in the Cross. And I'm going to take the passage from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 7, if you join me with join uh, there with me. Let, let me read it for us here. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope, and hope does not disappoint because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Oh man, what a message. And to think about that during this beautiful Lenten season. So uh, <clears throat> think about this with me. The cross. Man, it's kind of central in our language even. We use the word crux. We talk about um, the centrality of an issue, the centrality of the cross, crux. So we speak of the crux of the matter and uh, the heart, the centrality of the matter, and, and we go to the cross in our language to, to express that. It's the central issue, the, the heart of the matter. You know, <clears throat> the Greeks had um, a pantheon of gods and they, they had a strange religion. And uh, in their mythology, they believed that the gods could become angry at man. However, their gods of their imagination could be placated with uh, some kind of sacrifices. And I've often thought, is that how the God of the Bible is? Does he have to be placated with sacrifices, even human sacrifice? So if that would or two, what kind of a sacrifice might please the holy God of the Bible? So listen to what Micah says. He asked the question, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? And the answer is no, not for the holy God, of course not. You know, archaeologists studying the uh, many ancient past religions I've had the luxury of tromping around on them, the Incas, the Mayas, the Aztecs. I'd like someday to get down to Egypt and see those. I have been um, all over Israel <clears throat> and have seen some of the things from antiquity there, but archaeologists tend to suggest that ancient cultures used human sacrifice. Now, I've had some Mayan friends that say, no, the Mayas didn't do that. And uh, here's, here's a uh, stone up at Machu Picchu, and I have been there. Um, and it's thought to have been an altar um, on which human sacrifice was done. So I, I've often thought, as I tried to wrap my head around all of this, is the cross just another form of human sacrifice? Of course not. 
But there have been you know, Christian groups that have tried to eliminate the cross. They've gone through their hymnals and tried to purge things like blood and the gory idea of a, a cross. They see it as gruesome, an object of cruelty and inhumanity. They object to its bloody repulsiveness. And it's, it's said to be so primitive and barbaric. After all, it was just a Roman invention for execution of the worst kind of, crinso, of criminals. And then I come along and in my Bible, God's Word, I read passages like Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Or in 8.32 of Romans, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Or in Ephesians chapter 5, in the passage on marriage and uh, the role of husband and the role of wives, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Well, it doesn't sound like human sacrifice quite. Something else is going on here. You know, the Bible is pretty clear that sin is deadly. In other words, in a moral universe, sin has a consequence that is called death. Now, the temptation back in the Garden of Eden, which promised so much good, turned out to be so bad, terrible in its consequences. After Adam and Eve sinned, you remember, they hid from God, ashamed, of course. And the sentence of judgment was banishment from the Garden of Eden and from the presence of God, which resulted in spiritual death. So the last thing we read about Adam was, and he died. So you see, separation from the source of life is what leads to death. So as children of Abraham, because we're all born in Abraham's image, image Abraham, I mean, uh, excuse me, Adam, Adam had sons and daughters in his own image. So we, as children of Adam, have all been infected with sinfulness. It's not that we're all as rotten through and through as we could be, and that there is no uh, good in us, and we're evil clean through. But you know what? None of us is as bad as we could be, nor as good as we ought to be. We were all born with a propensity to sin. And that propensity causes us to sin, which results in the sentence of death. The Bible describes our plot, says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin. Now, that's a spiritual deadness, of course. That ultimate results in a physical de de deadness and an eternal separation from God. Or in Ephesians, Paul says, like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. In chapter 4, that same book of Ephesians, he says, uh, speaking of the, of the heathen, they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. So there's a moral responsibility to all of this. But you know what? The message of the cross is that the cross put an end to all of that. Denial, hiding, separation from the source of life, dying as if it were in secret like old yellow dog wanting to crawl under the porch and die, or of being afraid of God and his wrath, no, and what we have in the cross is the option of having life restored to us. So the message is that God really does love us, you see. Instead of God hating us and eliminating us from his beautiful earth, he loves us and he sympathizes with our plight. He knows that if we were to die for our sins, it would be impossible to have a relationship with him. We would be hurled into eternity without that eternally separated from him and the life that only he can give. So he chose to do something about it. He did what we could not do for ourselves. God himself 
took our place and died instead of us having to do it. He didn't passively sit by and, and let his son do it for him. Oh, this is not an angry God in heaven than an infinitely loving Jesus on the cross. It isn't a matter of Jesus taking the Father's wrath. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. You see, the love of Christ is the love of God. Now, oh, wait a minute. The Father is God, and the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. Now, the Son is not the Father, and the Father is not the Son. Let's not get that. But, but the three are one. They are each God. So, we read, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So, in this work of salvation, the Father and the Son are completely at one. The atonement took place because God the Father loves us and made provision in his Son for our salvation. This love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. What a concept. In the cross, God is saying that we're worth whatever it takes. He loved us. And he, he loves you. And he did enough to lay down his life. That's how much he loves us. He did that for you and for me. In an unmistakable way, God has said, I love you. He stretched out his arms on the cross and unmistakably showed us. The third thing is, this message tells me that the problem that you and I have has been fixed. It really has. Whatever had to be done about sin, God did it on the cross. He did it perfectly, he did it completely, and he did it finally. It's done. Everything has been fully taken care of, but God doesn't force it on us. He doesn't make us love him and make us have a relationship with him, with him. He offers. And we have to accept what he has done. We have to accept his offer. There's no longer any reason to be estranged from God. You see, we don't need to fear him. We don't need to be scared of him. He's the one who laid down his life for us. And we can perfectly trust one who loves us that much. He has eliminated all the barriers. In the Christmas event, we are told that he eliminated the distance and the message is that he came near to us. In the cross, he eliminated the sentence of death that we were under. He died in our place. That's paid for. It's canceled if we'll accept it. And in the torn veil in the temple, a few days later, or, or a few hours, while he was still on the cross, actually, he eliminated alienation by reconciliation. We have access to the Holy of Holies, the throne of God. All we have to do is accept his love, trust him, and he took care of everything. That's called believing. Believing isn't just a mental assent that Jesus really did live and really did die. Believing is trusting God that he knows exactly what we need and how to take care of it for us. Believe him when he tells us he loves us and receive his offer of grace. You see, you and I are loved. And we then now can love him in return. That's what we really ought to do. That's the normal, natural response. So here's the deal. Since God loves us personally, we need to respond personally. Since God has come all the way to us, we need to turn around and come to him. And since God offers to forgive, we need to accept his offer. And since God has made it possible, 
we can have a personal relationship with him, with God, in Christ Jesus. What a concept. Isn't that beautiful? I'm glad Paul penned those words for us. Pray with me, would you, Father? What an offer. And maybe we haven't seen it quite this way, but today we would receive, we would accept, we would be believers that Jesus Christ really does love us and really did die for us, not just for humanity in general, but for each of us personally. And we accept that. And when you offer forgiveness, we accept that. And we're going to claim to be forgiven. Thank you. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for joining me today.